Hi, my name is Amy Heisey, and this is my friend Elizabeth Salasco, and she's joining me today to talk to us about icons. Elizabeth is a fine artist. She's also a very talented iconographer, so she's just going to talk a little bit about what an icon is, how to make it, and what you can do if you're interested in learning how to do it yourself. My name is Elizabeth Salasco, and I'm an artist and an iconographer, and uh... I went to art school in New York City and left to study iconography, uh, Russian Orthodox iconography, and um, finished my degree in art in Colorado. And but what what I do now is basically icons, make icons or religious paintings. The history of art in our church is very very diverse, and but we what we get a lot of in the United States is Roman art. So, um, but there's a big section of the Catholic Church that's Eastern, they're much more heavy in iconography. So we have Eastern Catholic churches in the United States, um, but you have to search them out. So it's not going to be your, you know, your local um, St. Joe, like the church that you probably frequent. But if you just Google like Eastern Catholic churches in your area, there's probably um, some really beautiful churches that that you could visit. Um, and you'd see a lot of icons in those churches. So in our Roman churches, we're not going to see icons too, too much. They might have some here and there, um, but it's mostly going to be more of the Roman because it's a Roman rite. So it's going to be more Roman artwork. Yeah. An icon is a very special thing. <laughs> it's a, um, my goodness, it's a sacred piece of, of work, right? So it belongs in the church or in the home in an honored place. Um, what makes an icon different from art in general is that there's a there's a much more strict um, way to create them. So there's rules that we have to follow if we want to say that this is an orthodox icon. Um, we follow the traditions that have been handed down and it's very particular as far as material goes and the way that they're painted, um, the different layers that, you know, the, the different layers that are on top of one another, they have to be in a specific order. Um, and then it's an icon, it gets blessed at the end. Um, and it's sacred because it's kind of like um, the chalice, like the chalice is used to hold the body and blood of Christ in during the mass. And so it's a sacramental piece. And so icons in the Eastern churches are used not in that way, but in a, in a similar way. It's a part of the architecture. It's a part of the process of when you walk into the church, you venerate the icon and it's usually whoever you know has that feast day, um, but you kiss them. So they're, they're really, they're a touchstone for our spirituality because it's something tangible and physical and we can see it and we kiss it and we light candles and um, it's just a way of communicating with God in a way that you wouldn't necessarily go up and maybe kiss a painting, um, but you could meditate with a painting. So you could meditate with both a religious painting or an icon, but um, the icons are just touched in a different way. And they're also used very often in processions. Um, at different different feast days too. Yeah, we had icons in the house growing up, um, but I didn't pay too too much attention to them. Um, but it it wasn't until so I went to art school in New York, and then I had an encounter with an icon in Wisconsin of all places. Like that's like really random, right? Um, it's actually can you see this in this in the shot? This icon, the Sacred Heart icon. So that's the icon. And it's not even my favorite icon. It's like not the best looking icon at all. But um, I have a copy of it because it just meant so much to me. But that was in the church in La Crosse, Wisconsin. It was done by some nuns that live there. Um, and I was praying in front of this icon. And I just thought I, f I was feeling kind of lost at school. I was like just not getting enough instruction. And I was really just craving something that was just traditional and old and um, and God just kind of fulfilled that need, but he, I was in front of this icon and I literally just felt like there must be a way to learn how to, if, if the, if these women are painting these things, there must be a way to learn. And so thank God Google was a thing at the time. And I just like Googled, um, how to learn iconography. And, and I was already in New York city. So it was just wonderful that the school happened to be in New York city. And, um, so it was the Russian Orthodox, um, the Prosopon School of Iconology. And I left school to go study um, how to make icons. And it really, um, it really blew me away because there's just so much 
uh, tradition and poetry and beauty and God and theology and just all of it was just and and art, you know, like and technique and and um, material. And I just I just fell in love with it. Yeah. And I have loved it ever since. It's really uh, it's a remarkable thing to be able to, um, to have learned. Yeah. I think both. I, I consider myself both because I'm I'm trained as a fine artist. I did finish my degree and I've, I've since I was in kindergarten, I've taken art lessons and I just I can't get enough of that either. I, I have, you know, I learn online still to this day just how to be a better painter, how to draw better. Um, and I love fine art. I just love I love fine art. Um, but I think iconography is in a category all its own. Um, it's not art in a sense because it's not about self-expression. It's about expressing what's in the Bible. And so it's not self-expression. I feel like art's a little bit more, which, there's a place for everything at the table, right? But there is a difference. So there's, yeah, so there's self-expression and then there's just handing down the faith that's um, a part of a visual, um, what's the word I'm looking for? A visual canon. Like there's just certain things like you wouldn't portray Mary in a certain way, even if I wanted to. Um, so I would save those sort of self-reflection um, pieces, you know, that are still theological, I would save that for maybe a painting as opposed to expressing that in an icon. So I think saying writing an icon is fine. Um, and it makes more sense because it isn't, it, you are painting it though. It is paint. You're making paint. Um, but you are writing it. And I, I heard it put this way and I thought this was really beautiful. You don't paint the gospels, you write the gospels and icons are the gospels in visual form. And so I like that idea, but I've also heard that it was just like a translation issue. Um, there was something having to do with in, in Russian, you, like a painter paints a fence, but a, a, um, an artist is the author of a painting. And I thought that was, that was really cool. So they use the word writing again. I could, this is just all stuff I've researched and asked people about. Cause some people are really like, no, you have to say, write an icon. You can't say paint an icon. And it's like, well, you know, maybe God will correct us when we get to heaven. I have no idea. <laughs> writing makes sense. Like saying writing does um, take it out of the category of art even more. And it helps people to see it as something that's different from painting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it is paint. So traditional icons are made out of egg tempera. And you basically take an egg. Um, and this is actually, this is um, how painters painted throughout history. Like this is how paint was made in the Renaissance time. So it's nothing too specific to iconography. Um, with the invention of art stores and manufacturing paint, like we've, you know, we can just go to the art store and buy a tube of paint. But so icons stick to the tradition of making, making your own paint. Um, so you take an egg and you get the, the egg yolk off, or not the yolk, the white part, and you just take the yolk, the yellow part, and you have to release the inside of the egg from the from the the sack that holds the whole little yolk together um, so the inside of that's uh, put into a cup and then we mix it with white wine and that's sort of our egg emulsion so that will be the binding agent that makes the paint paint um, and then egg tempera is powdered pigment and so I have a collection of diff all different colors and um, some people have much more fabulous collections than I do I'm really jealous of my one friends but uh, I have my collections fine enough but so it's just powdered um, powdered pigment with different colors and uh, mostly they're just they're natural pigments so it's nothing manufactured uh, my teacher actually when she would travel she would like find local like stones and like crush that up and make paint out of it and i just thought gosh that's so cool you know i mean talk about glorifying earth you know creation is coming together and glorifying god um so yeah so you you mix these two things together and that creates the paint and so um you can change the color by changing the formula of the pigments that you use um and that goes on the icon board and so I even have chickens, so I'll, I'll often use their, their eggs are nicer. If you can get organic eggs, the, the yolk is a lot stronger uh, than store-bought eggs. So it's a really nice, yeah. My kids are rollerblading in the hallway. <laughs> My kids do that too. Yeah. <laughs> it's always supposed to be on wood. The wood, the grain of the wood is supposed to be oriented upwards. So it's kind of like when you're looking at the icon, your thoughts and your prayers are oriented up towards God. And so there's, um, it's important that the wood grain is going up. 
So it takes a long time to make the board itself. Um, there's, you can have a board that um, doesn't have braces on the back, but sometimes when they have braces on the back, it helps with warping because they last forever. I mean, they last forever unless there's a fire, God forbid, but they, they're really kind of heirloom pieces. Um, and they, wood is, is um, it's organic. And so it's affected by the environment. So sometimes if it's like a moist environment, or a very, very dry environment like we have in Colorado, that it can do weird things to the wood. So braces help um, combat that that sort of natural ebb and flow of the wood. Um, the gesso takes takes a good couple days to do. Um, it's a homemade gesso. So gesso is kind of like um, if you've ever painted a wall, you and, and it's drywall, you always want to put a primer on first. And so that way the paint can not just soak through the drywall. So same thing with the icon board. You have this piece of wood, if you just put paint on wood, the wood's like a sponge, so it's gonna just like suck up the color, you won't see anything. So painting it white first helps to help the person see the color and the image that you're creating. So you always have to have gesso on the board. So this is completely flat and that's fine. That's one style of icon. And then there's another way where they have the centers um, carved out and it's usually done by hand. Um, but you can see the little indentation. Um, and, and that's pretty traditional. And I like this look too, because it kind of, my teacher explained it as like, we have, there's an inside of our body, which is like our spiritual in our, you know, in our soul. And then there's our, the outside of our body, which is probably the least interesting part, but it's important to have, you know? Um, but so there's the inside and the outside of the icon. And there's always a, a portion of the image that will come out onto the border and that sort of represents evangelization. So it's, it's important to like be all these things, but you have to, you have to share it with the world. And so like the halo almost always pops off onto the, onto the outside. Um, here, it's just the, the guardian angel, like the little bit of the incensor is hanging out just a little bit. Um, so I like that just a little spot where you can, you meditate on the importance of evangelization and sharing your faith with people. And also protects the image too. I think there's always like a, there's always a spiritual component to, to reasons why icons look the way that they do. And sometimes there's just a practical one of like, it protects the icon. So this is um, liquid clay. Um, it's called bowl or red bowl. Um, and it's really, um, it's, it's a, it's a red clay that's mixed with like glue and, um, and you mix it up together and it's like a liquidy clay. Okay. So it, after you have just the plain board and you have your image on the board, the first thing to go on is the clay. And this is sort of like the red clay of Adam. So think of like the creation of the universe, right? It's like, it's, it's all these things, all these nature, my dog. <laughs> Sorry. So it's kind of like creation itself where it's like you have all these natural elements and then and then on the last day man man is created, right? So we have Adam, the red clay of Adam. Um so that's put on the halo. So you can see wherever there's gold, there's almost always the red clay underneath. So you put the red clay underneath the halo and you burnish it, you sand it and you burnish it. It takes me about a day just to do the red clay part. Once that's down and dried and burnish and it's really shiny, then you get the gold leaf out. And in order to adhere the gold leaf onto the clay, you breathe onto the clay, which is very biblical, right? This is like straight out of the Bible. God breathed into Adam and gave him life. And um, so you, I breathe in, th in threes. So I just take a section and with the hot air from my breath, I literally just go <sighs> like this. And I'll drink tea sometimes, so it's like even hotter. Um, so it moistens the clay and then you lay the gold on top and the gold is now one with the clay. Like you literally have to like scratch it off in order for it to come off, which you don't want to do because it just takes you. Um, so the gold represents God. And then, um, so it's kind of like God being breathed into Adam and Adam is now this, you know, this image and likeness of God. Um, and to remember that the clay is underneath, right? Because body, body good, spirit good. It's not body bad, spirit good. It's like, no, God made us good. Um, and without the body, we can't hold, we can't be the vessels that we need to be. So we need both of these things. 
So we want to remember that the clay is underneath the halo and the first line, the first line of paint to go on. So from this point, you know, it's just wood, gesso, clay. And now from this point on, and gold, sorry. And from this point on, it's pigment. So it's, it's sort of like the marriage of these two different things. But so to remember that the clay is underneath the halo, we paint this red line around and that's the first line to go on with pigment. And so that's a purified red, right? So it's like all the dirt and all the muck is out of the clay now. It's purified now that we have God. And um, so it's a pure red that goes on. And so it's called the, the marriage line or the red crown of martyrdom. Um, because it's this marrying of these two, el two different elements that now are becoming one. And so that's the, the beginning, the, sort of the opening up of the icon. The last line to go on, so it's the alpha line, the omega line, the last line to go on is the white. So that's the closing of the icon. So it's kind of this opening and then it's, everything's painted and then you close the icon around the halo. The white just represents the gesso that we started with. So it's like the, the very last thing to go on. And you can see that the white line too. So you'll see that often in icons, you'll see a red and a white. Um, the easiest way to describe it would be if you think of a rainbow, and red, say like we just talked about the red clay of Adam. And so this red is going to be all like the earthy, right? So we're like, we're down here and it's all earthy and there's, um, you know, okay, all those colors. And then as you move up the rainbow, right, there's green in the center and then there's blues and violets. And that's sort of like more ethereal, like heavenly, heavenly colors. Um, the color that's right in the middle is green. And that's always represented as man. So man is green in a sense. I mean, yes, the red clay of Adam and it's red, but as far as the rainbow goes, green is man because we are both human and divine in a sense, right? We, we hold God. So we're body and soul. And so the, the color that's in the middle is green. And so um, it's always what the skin tone is underneath, which is funny because in fine art, we often will start with green too, right? We'll paint green on a human as like the undertone of something, right? Um, so it's kind of funny that it like, it kind of shows up in fine art also, but the theological reason in iconography is that it's that middle um, theology of the, yeah, of, of the rainbow. God is all, always red on the inside and blue on the outside. And Mary's always the opposite in iconography. Red on the, I'm sorry, blue on the inside, red or maroon on the outside. Because they were, um, Mary was born human and clothed with divinity. And then Christ was born divine and he clothed himself with humanity. Something along those lines. I get them mixed up all the time, but it has to be, they have to be different. Mm -hmm. So whenever you walk into an Eastern church, you'll always see that Mary and Jesus are the exact opposite colors. Yeah. Because it's not fine art, right? Like we're not really supposed to copy and fine art and say look what I did and if you do do that you always have to say oh this is a copy of because we copy I mean art fine art you're always copying masters for learning purposes but you wouldn't say you know look what I created I did <laughs> I have a, a drawing that I did of a Bougereau painting and but I say specifically everywhere I you know share oh yeah okay. this one so whenever I share this I always say this is a Bougereau and he's been dead over like a hundred years but I still have to say this is not like I didn't create this. This is a cop, a master copy of a master painting. Okay, yeah. um, so so there's that. So we copy in fine art all the time, but you you'd have to credit, right? Um, in iconography, it's a lot different because they want you to pass down this visual canon without do it without self expression. Um, so the copyrights are a little bit different in a sense because it's like you really are trying to stick to traditions. Now, have people made new icons over the centuries? Absolutely. Like they're, um, you know, it's not like they like were formed. Icons weren't formed <laughs> when Adam was formed. In a sense, Adam was an icon, but like, you know, you know what yeah. I mean? Um, so at some point there's always like new icons made, um, but they're a part of, they're usually part of a visual canon, right? So I wouldn't, I wouldn't have an icon of say like Mary, like holding hands with Jesus running in a field because that's not a part of our visual canon. It's not biblical. It's not right. Um, so there's that, that would be something like if I was really inspired to do something like that, it would be 
fine art or religious mm-hmm. art or something. Um, so yeah, they should all look a certain way for sure. Um, and sometimes, yeah, I mean, some, it's, it's impossible to completely erase the iconographer though. So there's always going to be a way probably on some level to tell, oh, that looks like Elizabeth Zelasko probably did that icon versus, you know, somebody else. So it's impossible to completely erase the person or erase the brush strokes or, um, but for that reason, we're not supposed to sign the front of them. So it's not, this isn't like, hey, look what I did. And I'm going to sign my name on it. Um, we just don't, we don't do that. So yeah. yeah, I sometimes if people want me to, I'll sign the back. Because um, sometimes people want to know, I want to remember who did this for my family. Um, was it passed down throughout the generations? I want to, you know, so, and I'll do that. I'll honor that. But I often, I won't do that unless I'm asked to do that. You can tell that like, this is more, self-expression or interpretation of uh mary holding baby jesus and this is more symbolic this doesn't it doesn't look photorealistic right this looks more realistic icons are more symbol they're more of um they're stylized to portray a certain idea to um is a teaching tool um they mean something the way that their faces are shaped means something um, usually there's like a larger forehead. That's a sign of wisdom. They have longer, narrow noses and small mouths is like a sign of meekness. Their eyes are usually bigger because they're always looking at God. Um, the difference between an icon of saints and an icon of Christ is that their pupils are actually more oval shaped and a saints are more oval shaped and an icon of Christ, he has like a perfect circle. And it's because he's, he's perfection. So he is not looking at himself in a sense, right? Like we're always, you know, looking at God, but for him, it's like, it's, he is perfection. And so it's shown that way. Yeah. So it's all, it's all symbolic. They'll always show a little bit of an ear as a sign of like, you're listening. I'm listening to God. Um, yeah. So that's a, that's a good example. Also this, just another one. So of Christ, this is like the veil of Veronica or, um, it's also called the holy napkin, which I think is not, it's like funny. I don't know. Just to say napkin is kind of funny. But um, just a good example of like a drawing of Christ. Right? And it could be a painting too. It doesn't, it's not drawing versus paint. It's just, I just happen to have these as examples. But, um, you know, a drawing of Christ based off of, you know, a Roman-esque sort of idealized version, right? Versus an icon, which is symbolic. And so that's going to be another, just another example of that. When you go to church, um, and actually, and even a lot of like sacred art, like classical, you know, you go to Italy and you walk around, you're not going to see a ton of like Marys that are like, you know, (laughs) it's just not. So it's, I think it, I think there's a crossover. It's not just icons, but when you walk into a church, you want to be met with love wherever you're at. So you don't want to like, if you came into a church and you're mourning, say you're mourning the death of somebody or you're suffering in some way. And you come into that church and you're met with all these, like, you know, all these faces that are just not mirroring your, where you're at, you know? Um, So it's really a loving thing that I can pray in front of this icon, whether I'm overjoyed about something or I'm in sorrow or I'm in pain and suffering or I'm celebrating, like, I'm always going to be met with this sort of stable emotion. Rapid fire. This is how an icon is made. <laughs> this talk is usually an hour long, but I'm going to, we're just going to do it. So there's a board. So you have the board and it's made in a specific way, right? Like the inset and the, the braces on the back. And then I get the board. I make the gesso. Um, it's marble dust and uh, chalk and rabbit skin glue, which is just yeah. interesting. <laughs> so then um, that goes on the board and it's several layers. So as soon as it dries, you put another layer on. And you do that several times. You let it dry for like a couple days and then you sand the heck out of it until it literally feels like a smooth, like quartz countertop. Like it's just real smooth, real nice. I get um, the image that I need to make. So it's drawn out the way that I want it to look. I put transfer paper down, which is just like a thin sheet of paper that has graphite on one on one end. So I put that down. I put my drawing on top. I trace my drawing on take that all off and then I just have the sketch that's on the board then I scrape the image into the board um, and that's just because the the image isn't supposed to be like 
superficially laid on top. It's supposed to be like one with the board. And so it's kind of like you write the word of God on your heart, you carve it in kind of like the laws in the, in the, in the stone that Moses had, you know, it's like, it's, it's carved into this earth. Um, um, so it's not just laying on top. So it's a part of it now. And then we do the clay. The clay is the first thing that goes on. And I, you know, burnish the heck out of that. And then we put the gold leaf on top. You do the red line. Um, and then it's the first layer is called rose krish. And this is, again, this is, this is the Russian Orthodox way of doing it. Okay. So there's other different forms of iconography. This is what I learned was the Russian Orthodox. So you have um, this thing called rose krish, which is the first layer. And it's kind of like um, in creation where God was just like, let there be land, you know. And so this is like real gritty pigments. Like it actually, I have to stand it down a little bit after this. But it's the opening up of the icon. And it's very dark colors. Kind of like before God said, let there be light, right? So it's just the darkness of the earth. Almost like a um, chaos a little bit. Because it's all just, it looks like marble almost. Just really very earthy looking. Um, then the first highlight is kind of like when God said, let there be light. The first illumination, if, if you'll, the, the first enlightenment, you know, the, the first knowledge of God. Um, so that's the light. So anything that it's kind of like my teacher explained it, like when you put the light, the room is pitch black and you flick the lights on, you're not going to see any details. You're just going to see basic shapes. There's my dresser. There's my bed. So these are all the basic shapes of that we're working with. Um, then you do your first float, which is, it brings harmony with the, with the first layer, which is rose krish. It brings harmony with the highlight. And so we meditate on reconciliation at this point. So kind of like, you know, here I am Lord, and here's all my earthly stuff and here's all my sin and here's you, here's the highlight. And it's bringing, you know, knowledge to what I am. And then the first float that goes on top brings those two colors together in harmony. And so we fo- we meditate on reconciliation, going to confession. Real beautiful. And then from that point on, you're just building up. You're doing another highlight, another float, another highlight, another float. Until the very end, you finish. It's almost like building a pyramid. You just get more and more detailed as you get up um, and more finer lines. And then... You have the last highlight. There's no float on top of that one because this is sort of like after we, when we die, we're going to be in front of God and the veil is lifted and there's nothing in between us anymore. And it's just that pure light hitting my face. Like right now there's so many veils and there's so much dirt in between from my own stuff, but it's like, um, yeah. And that's just lovely. Yeah. And then you paint that white line around the halo that closes the, closes the icon and then you varnish it. So you'll seal the icon so that it can, can't wash away or get hit with water and drip or something. So the ceiling is sort of, I think we meditate on um, confirmation. So it's kind of like you get anointed with oil at confirmation. And so this is sort of like the anointing in a sense of the icon. It, it like seals the icon, seals the gift, you know, um, but it should be blessed too. I mean, it should go the, the traditional way of blessing them, at least in the Byzantine church, um, oh, and, and in the Orthodox Church, too, is that the icon actually sleeps on the altar overnight. How beautiful is that? So it spends the whole night on the altar, and then Mass is celebrated the next morning, and then um, it's venerated by the congregation, and then whoever takes the icon takes it after that. So depending on the size of the icon and the complexity of the icon, so if you're doing like an 8 by 10 I think this is actually an 8 by 10 So, I mean... Uh, one face as opposed to maybe something like Pentecost where like everybody's there and there's lots of detail like that could take very, very long to do. Um, But I would say I've never, ever done one under 15 hours and it's usually more like 40. Yeah. And depending on the size too, I did the largest one I ever did was a 30, 24 by 36. And that took a long time because that's huge. That's a lot of material too. And you're kind of it takes so long just to paint all those little things and it's it's a wonderful experience but it's yeah it takes a long time yeah I think you can be I mean I think there's also just people who are like I'm interested in that like I want to just try it out and uh, my teacher would always teach whoever came in and wanted to learn so there was people that um you know weren't orthodox or weren't Christian even and just like I just you know felt drawn to it and she would teach them so um but I feel like 
I've talked to people and it does feel vocational in a sense. Like I, I know a lot of people who are like, this feels like a vocation. It feels like something to do, like a, like a calling in a sense. I think it can be. Um, I definitely felt called to it. I mean, it was sort of an encounter, right? It was like something that came from being in front of this icon. Um, but I try not to over spiritualize that too much because yeah. it's, I'm not, I'm literally like no better than anybody else. You know what I mean? Like it doesn't elevate, it shouldn't really be elevated in a sense of like, um, yeah, call, yeah. Like, yeah. I feel like we're all called to be icons and we're all called to, um, be fully who God has called us to be. So if that's a part of me expressing myself fully in light of God, then that's right. That like anything you do then is vocational in a sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you have a young child who's interested in doing religious arts, don't do it with acrylic paint. Um, it's just that the, some of these pigments are poisonous and it's powder. So you're like, do you trust a three-year-old with powder? I don't think so. I don't even trust my kid with like blush, you know? So it's like, I wouldn't hand them egg tempera paint to mess around with. Um, so I would say, you know, you can play around with acrylic paints. Um, that maybe a teenager might be a little bit more trustworthy with some of these materials. They're also expensive. Like the materials themselves are expensive. Just that little sheet of, um, you know, a 25 pack of gold leaf is like 50 bucks. So it's like, it's not a, it's not a hobby that you, you know, like you just, you know, um, so be smart about it. Yeah. And, and if your kid's old enough to be respectful with the materials, watch them anyway, like just make sure they're not, they're easy to spill. And then you wouldn't want that on their hands. Um, and washing them, you should have gloves on when you wash the palette off because you don't want to touch that stuff. If you don't want that to get into your system. Um, so I would say materials wise, I would say it should be a certain age for sure. You can practice drawing icons. There's all sorts of things online that I've seen just like little, like, here's how you do it. an icon hand, you know, maybe just practice how hands look. Cause they're not, it's not intuitive. It's very different from fine art in that way. The, the proportions are all different from natural proportions. I mean, it still looks like a human, but it's, um, the proportions are different. Yeah. So you could practice that as you get older and then maybe take a class. I definitely recommend doing it under the guidance of somebody like say, say you are 20 something and, uh, you want to learn, you know, I think that it's important to find a teacher, um, cause it's a very spiritual practice and you don't want to, you don't want to do that alone. It's always good to have, have a mentor of some sort. So yeah. Thank you for watching this and thanks for all the great questions. It's been, I, I just love talking about this. This is what I love to do. And so I love to share what I do with people. Um, if you feel interested or you know somebody who's interested in learning iconography, I highly recommend doing it. It's really a beautiful adventure to learn how to make these things. And it's just such a, it's been a real treasure to have icons in my house. Um, and at the very least, just get icons for your house, get holy, holy images in your home. They will have a huge impact on your children. Um, if you think about all the things that we see all day long, even on our phones, um, you know, how much of it is holy, how much of it is a real sacred thing, right? And so when we put holy images into our homes, we bring God into our lives and we, we um, elevate what we see, right? We elevate the visual things around us and they inspire us. I mean, um, when I was younger, it had a huge impact on me. My mom hung a picture of Our Lady of Guadalupe up in the hallway and it had a massive impact on my uh, relationship with God. And so I want to encourage you to bring holy images into your home. Yeah. But thanks for watching. Yeah. My website's elizabethzelasco.com and I have an Instagram account where I share about iconography. I believe it's at elizabeth.zelasco. Um, yeah. And I'm reachable to the, through those things. I sell prints of my artwork on, on elizabethzelasco.com.